Our first, um, our first speaker today is Professor George Britton. And George um, graduated from the University of Sheffield, where he went on to do a PhD. Uh, George Britton is the author of many, many uh, seminal papers on carotenoids and 17 books, most notably the carotenoid series. George Britton was president of the International Carotenoid Society from its inception in 1996 to 2002 and is a self-confessed carotenoids addict. So George will be talking now uh, on Lieutenant Zayazanthin, the autobiography. <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> this is my, my old friend, um, which I use for carotenoid lectures. Um, it has the formula of beta carotene. But um, for today, especially, I've had to do a quick enzyme reaction and hydroxylate the molecule in a couple of places. You note know that the stereochemistry is not defined. That's because I'm not an enzyme. Um, so thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the kind invitation to attend this meeting. Um, this morning, as you know, we have lectures by some of the leading figures in macular carotenoids. But first, there's me. And I have to confess that never have I worked with the eye, never have I worked with macular carotenoids. So why on earth am I here? Um, let's see if I can operate this thing. Yes. The title of my talk seems a bit strange, Lutein and Zeaxanthin, the autobiography. And that's because at a meeting like this, the two characters who often do not have their story told are the main players in this, in this story, and that is Lutein and Zeaxanthin themselves. So this talk, here is my title, and here are the two main authors, Lutein and Zeaxanthin because what I want to do is to tell you something of their story in the way that perhaps they might like you to, to know about themselves. When you see a picture like this of a crowd of humans, one thing that's noticeable, they all look the same. But when you look a bit closer, then you can see that humans do tend to look different, some more different than others. And the same is true for carotenoids. When you see a lot of carotenoid structures together, even if they're in focus, then they all look very much the same. <laughs> they all look this same kind of shape, so it looks complicated especially when you think there's around 700 different carotenoids known in nature. But when you look a little more closely, you can see that each carotenoid has its own individual characteristics. Some are different lengths, some have rings at the end of the molecule, some have functional groups. So, and this allows us to say something about carotenoid chemistry. Many of you are probably afraid of carotenoid chemistry. But in carotenoid chemistry, there are really only two things that you need to know. The first thing is that they're all the same. And the second thing is that they're all different. And when we look at the first carotenoid structure, this is beta carotene, the parent. This tells us a lot about the properties of these molecules. You look at this structure, it's a hydrocarbon, so you can judge its solubility. You know that you're dealing with substances which are not soluble in water, and solubility in many organic solvents and organic media may also be limited. The other main feature of this is the 
system of conjugated double bonds. And this is what gives the carotenoids their main properties, because it's this system which is responsible for their light absorption properties, responsible for their triplet state energy, which is something that may be mentioned later, for their reactivity. It's a very reactive system, especially towards oxidation. And it also controls the shape of the molecule. It's a long, rigid, quite ri uh, linear molecule. Now, in this conference, we're interested in the macular xanthophils, zeaxanthin, lutein, and mesozeaxanthin. In many ways, they look the same. In other ways, they look a little different. And these macular xanthophils, as everyone knows, are considered to have various possible functions as blue light filters, quenchers of singlet oxygen, antioxidants. And a word of warning, when thinking of carotenoids as antioxidants, in the literature you will often find confusion because there are two different ways in which carotenoids may give this protection. One of these ways is a physical um, protection mechanism in which the carotenoid quenches the energy of singlet oxygen or prevents its formation. And singlet oxygen, if it is formed, is a very damaging species. Alternatively, the carotenoids are considered to have actions against um, peroxidative chain reactions. And this is a kind of true antioxidant um, role. I'm not going to deal with this kind of antioxidation because the literature is a bit of a minefield and you will find almost any result that you want somewhere in the literature because it is very difficult to control experiments on that kind of work. The quenching of singlet oxygen is a much better defined mechanism because in any case where you have some molecule which can act as a sensitizer by absorbing light, and if some of this can be converted into an excited triplet state, this triplet state can pass energy onto normal oxygen and produce this species called singlet oxygen, which is damaging. And carotenoids can interfere with this, pro with, with this process, either by quenching the energy of the sensitizer and preventing the formation of singlet oxygen, or by absorbing the excess energy from the singlet oxygen itself and preventing it from causing damage. This produces a triplet state carotenoid and this triplet state carotenoid is harmless and just loses its, its excitation energy harmlessly. So this is a well-established protective mechanism. And we may hear something of these in other presentations during this conference. But let's look in a little more detail at what the macular xanthophils have to tell us about themselves. If we compare beta-carotene and zeaxanthin, we can see that in many ways they are very similar. We have the same rings at the end of the molecule, the same conjugated double bond system. But zeaxanthin has additional hydroxy groups. Therefore, it is a more polar carotenoid than beta-carotene. And this increased polarity does cause changes in the way that carotenoids may behave. If you think about the absorption of carotenoids, formation of micelles, whatever, then in any, any kind of such uh, uh, micelle or other system, the hydrophobic carotenes will be located somewhere in the hydrophobic core of the micelle or other product, whereas the xanthophils, such as zeaxanthin, 
are more likely to be associated with the outside part of these structures because of their increased polarity. So this has consequences or potential consequences for the absorption and the transport of the carotenoids. And indeed, the xanthophils are uh, transported in the blood on the um, high-density lipoproteins primarily, whereas the carotenes on the low-density lipoproteins. So there are differences in the way that these are absorbed and transported. There are also differences in the way that carotenes and xanthophils may associate into membranes and other structures. This is a typical bilayer, and carotene molecules are located inside the hydrophobic inner part of a bilayer, and they sort of, in a way, swim around there. Whereas zeaxanthin is just about the right length to span across the membrane with its polar groups associated with the polar outside parts of the membrane. So location in a membrane is also an important factor. And xanthophils have their own particular and peculiar distribution there in the membrane. Another property of carotenoids which is often overlooked is that they have a strong tendency not to exist as individual molecules, but to aggregate. They like to stick together. And this is especially true in a polar environment, such as we often find in the body. And they form stacked aggregates. There are different kinds of aggregates with the molecules in, in rather different orientations. And the formation of aggregates drastically alters the properties of the carotenoids. Their light absorption properties may be different. Their reactivity, protective mechanisms, all of this may be different. So whether a carotenoid exists in a unimolecular form or as an aggregate is important in relation to functioning. And the xanthophils are very susceptible to forming aggregates such as this, stacked aggregates. And this just illustrates the effect of this kind of aggregation on the absorption spectrum. This is the absorption spectrum of lutein in solution. But with this kind of stacked aggregate, this light absorption disappears. And instead, you'd see increasing absorption in the ultraviolet region. In other kinds of aggregation, you can see absorption here so that the color looks much more red. So aggregation and association of this kind is an important feature of the properties of carotenoid molecules. <clears throat> now what about comparing lutein with zeaxanthin? Because both of these are important in the macula. If we compare these two structures, again, the first thing you see is that they look very similar. Same shape, same size, same hydroxy groups on each end. But there are differences, and the differences arise in this part of the molecule, where in zeaxanthin, the double bond in the ring is in this position and forms part of the overall conjugated chromophore. Whereas in lutein, the double bond is in this part, in this position in the ring, and is no longer conjugated. So the conjugated double bond system of lutein stops here, whereas in zeaxanthin, it goes around to here. And this has consequences for the light absorption properties of the two molecules which are different. Zeaxanthin, with a longer chromophore, has a longer wavelength light absorption, only by around five or six nanometers, but this is nonetheless significant. Zeaxanthin has a lower energy triplet state and therefore is a better quencher of singlet oxygen than is lutein. So just that small difference can make a big difference in the properties of the carotenoid molecules. <clears throat>
Another feature of these molecules, you can see when you look at the structures in a three-dimensional form, because in zeaxanthin, ah, wrong one. In zeaxanthin, this hydroxy group is projecting above the plane. In lutein, it's projecting down below the plane. So the stereochemistry of these hydroxyl groups is different. And this can affect the way in which the molecules interact with other molecular systems in their environment. <clears throat> it also affects the overall shape of the molecule because zeaxanthin, with this fully conjugated system, is almost planar. The rings are only twisted slightly away from the same plane as the, as the rest of the molecule. Whereas in lutein, here we have a single bond, no double bond, and the, this ring is more or less free to rotate. So in lutein, this end ring can adopt many different shapes or positions. And because it's more free to rotate, overall it will behave as a rather larger, more bulky group than the end group of zeaxanthin. And one of the consequences of this is the way in which zeaxanthin and lutein may associate differently into other structures. Here, for example, is another simple representation of a membrane bilayer, where we have, as we saw before, beta carotene swimming in the hydrophobic part, zeaxanthin spanning across. Lutein, on the other hand, has been shown to adopt two different orientations within a bilayer. Some lutein will span across the bilayer just the same way as zeaxanthin does. Other molecules lie in a quite different position associating with the more polar extremities of the bilayer. So in this kind of association also, lutein and zeaxanthin behave differently. So we can see distinct differences between lutein and zeaxanthin. What about zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin? If you look at the structures like this, without any three-dimensional representation, they're identical. And that means that in most of their properties, zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin will behave in an identical way. The only difference is the stereochemistry, the chirality of the hydroxy group on the second ring. The chromophore, the double bond chromophore is exactly the same. So the light absorption properties will be exactly the same. The overall shape of the molecule, the same. So in virtually all the properties, these molecules are indistinguishable. You can separate them. There are ways and means of doing this. But in gross terms, um, they will behave in an identical way. There are possibilities, slight variations in the way in which these two forms of zeaxanthin will, can aggregate. Uh, and this can affect the properties to a small degree. But this is only very small. In most respects, they behave with identical properties. I'm talking about chemical properties. So we've looked at the three players, lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And if we compare uh, what's happening in the blood, if you analyze the blood, then Normally, you will see lutein is a major carotenoid component and much more so than zeaxanthin. Lutein, typically around 10 times as much as zeaxanthin. And normally, mesozeaxanthin is not detected in the blood. Um, 
from people on an unsupplemented diet. In the macula, on the other hand, lutein to zeaxanthin ratio can even be more zeaxanthin than lutein and is in some parts of the macula. So there is certainly some selectivity which seems to suggest that zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin as its component does have um, particular and desired properties and a role within the macula. Now, we've seen that chemically there seems to be no difference between zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin. So what's happening? Can the structures suggest anything that may be happening? Well, perhaps the structures cannot suggest this. Maybe an another line that perhaps we might think about is that it could be a question of availability rather than um, any difference in, in functional role. If we think of a normal human diet, if there is such a thing, we and our ancestors going back millions of years have always had two major carotenoids in our diet. One is beta-carotene, and we know that a role has evolved for beta-carotene as pro-vitamin A, and its important role in the visual pigments, etc. The other main carotenoid in the early diets would be lutein. And there is generally even more lutein than beta-carotene. So it would seem reasonable on evolutionary grounds to think that some role for lutein may have evolved. Zeaxanthin, we now can obtain significant amounts of zeaxanthin in our diet, but generally much less than lutein. And in a normal diet, whatever that may be, mesozeaxanthin is not expected to be detectable. And I have not seen any reports of this. Some people may contradict this from their own work, but I've not seen any mesozeaxanthin in a normal standard fruit and vegetable type of diet. Let's look at the dietary sources briefly. Lutein, the main source of lutein is anything green, um, except perhaps frogs. Because lutein is a key component of the photosynthetic apparatus in the chloroplasts of all higher plants. So any green leafy vegetables, green fruit, broccoli is a good source, very good sources of lutein. It's present in various other fruits, present in quite large amounts in pumpkin and squash. And we can usually, we will normally get some from egg yolk as well. But green leafy vegetables, leaves, have been in an animal, human and pre-human diet for millions of years. So lutein has always been with us. If we compare zeaxanthin, there is a small amount of zeaxanthin in chloroplasts. It's part of a protective mechanism called the xanthophyll cycle. The amount of zeaxanthin in green leaves does vary depending on conditions. There is, for example, normally more in high light conditions than low light conditions. But the amount is quite small. Most people now will obtain dietary zeaxanthin from peppers, sweet corn, or maize. But when we think about these, both of these originate from the Americas, especially South and Central America. And therefore, during much of its evolution, the human population did not have access to these. It's only in comparatively recent centuries that these have come into our diet. We 
There is some in some fruit, but usually not too large amounts. And in egg yolk now, depending on what the chickens have been fed, we may also find some zeaxanthin. There is one um, quite interesting source of zeaxanthin, goji berries, Chinese wolf berry, which has been used for many generations by Chinese populations in food and medicine. And this is extremely rich in zeaxanthin and is harvested on a large scale in China. But again, that was not accessible to European or pro-European populations. What about miso zeaxanthin? Does that exist? Well, there are various reports of the presence of miso zeaxanthin in natural sources. If chickens are fed synthetic zeaxanthin, then some miso zeaxanthin, along with the other zeaxanthin isomers, is detectable. Um, some birds and reptiles have oil, colored oil droplets in the retina. And one of these oil droplets contains zeaxanthin. And miso zeaxanthin is a component of that zeaxanthin. It's also possible to detect some miso zeaxanthin in tissues of some fish, primarily the skin, and also crustaceans, depending on what the, these creatures have been eating. But in all cases, the miso zeaxanthin is a metabolite from other dietary components. What we can say about miso zeaxanthin, this interesting compound, is that it is not a biosynthetic product unless someone has new results which show to the contrary. It is not considered to be a biosynthetic product which is biosynthesized within any plant-derived food that we know of. It can be formed from normal lutein by chemical transformation or by metabolic transformation. And I know that this is considered to be a major uh, route for the formation of mesozeaxanthin in the eye. It's also the main component of synthetic zeaxanthin. Um, back to that in a moment. The biosynthesis of zeaxanthin, the 3 hydroxy beta N group like this, the hydroxylation, the only examples known of this have this chirality, and the only enzymes that are known, the only genes that code for these enzymes, will lead to the formation of this 3R chirality. The opposite the hydroxy group going down, this is not known in a biosynthetic system. In the case of lutein, the biosynthetic reaction introduces the hydroxy group in this end group of lutein, introduces the hydroxy group down below the plane. Although in the case of lutein, this is not absolutely specific because some examples are known of the biosynthetic production of three-primed epilutein, in which the hydroxy group is above the plane. But this one does seem to be absolutely specific, as far as we know at the moment. The conversion of lutein with this chirality into zeaxanthin, if this occurs without any loss of stereochemistry, this would give rise to this end group and this end group, and consequently miso zeaxanthin. And this can be achieved chemically relatively easily and does seem to be a recognized metabolic process. Synthetic zeaxanthin 
when it's produced, is produced in, an, in a non-stereospecific form, the racemic form. And this is a mixture of the normal 3R, 3'-primed R zeaxanthin, the 3S, 3'-primed S, and meso zeaxanthin. And in this synthetic product, meso zeaxanthin does make up 50% of the total. So if, for example, you have chickens being fed synthetic zeaxanthin, <coughs> then you might expect and would probably find a considerable amount of mesozeaxanthin getting into the egg yolk. So this comes to an end of this very brief story of lutein and zeaxanthin on which people can now build and tell you something about what's really happening in the macula. Um, but they were... Lutein and Zeaxanthin were very keen to have their story told, and they thank you for listening. Thank you. Now, are there any questions for George Britton? No questions. Oh, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> ah, David. <laughs> Mm -hmm. in order to demonstrate MZ. Yeah. So it's most unlikely that there have been many reports of MZ in foods. Sorry. Did you hear all that? I, I heard all that. I don't know if the audience did. <laughs> well, the, the question is really, does MZ occur in natural foodstuffs? Mm -hmm. And you require a special process mm -hmm. in order to separate the two forms of zeaxanthin. Yeah. The columns available to do this have not been available until relatively recently. And people have not done it because zeaxanthin itself is relatively small in most foods. So people have not looked any further. Yes. Yeah, the, the, this, the, this is the case. Um, what I said was that, uh, to my knowledge, it has not been reported. And as you rightly say, uh, one possible reason for this is that people have not really looked for it with the techniques that would detect it. And uh, you know, may maybe someone like Fred would be able to give us more information on that. Actually, we have looked at this with the special columns, and we couldn't find them. And this has been reported for most green fruits and vegetables, yellow, orange. Uh, the common ones that we consume in uh, America and Europe. Now, there may be other foods that we haven't looked at, mm. but that's all I can say. It doesn't mean that it will not turn up somewhere at some time. I was just wondering um, what you think on the competition, given they are so similar and then again so different, um, what's, what's your thoughts on the competition um, upon absorption? Is there any... I mean, there are papers out there that um, suggest that, but I would like to have your opinion on that. I, I think when you, when you see papers about competition for absorption of different carotenoids, what they're usually looking at is competition between, say, carotene and lutein or lycopene and so on. Um, whereas I don't know of any data on competition between lutein and zeaxanthin. I was referring to beta carotene and lutein and zeaxanthin, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, for, for beta carotene and zeaxanthin, because there is such a difference in the, in the polarity of the molecules, then um, you certainly would expect to see differences in the absorption. Um, with lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, they are so similar. And in that kind of process, what the system is probably looking for is the overall size and polarity distribution of the molecule rather than very subtle differences in structure. So I think it would be difficult to find. I, mean, I, I don't know if anyone has looked at this. Someone may have done. But I, I, I don't recall seeing anything about um, competition between the two or large amounts of lutein preventing zeaxanthin and so on.
Um, it may do, just on, a, on, a, on the basis of a large amount of one thing will swamp the absorption of another one, but I don't know that this has been, been studied particularly. <laughs>